Thanks for joining us today. We'd love to hear how God is using this ministry in your life. So we encourage you to share your story with us at info at fellowshipgj.com or by clicking the share your story tab on the Church Center app. Also, if God is using this ministry to impact you, we wanna encourage you to partner with us financially. You can do that by clicking on the giving link located in the description below this video or online at fellowshipgj.com or if you're a member here at Fellowship Church, you can give through our Church Center app. This will help us continue to bring the message of Christ to our community and beyond. Again, thank you for joining us and enjoy today's service. Let's stand to our feet. You know what? It's a little sleepy in here. It's nobody's fault, but we're just gonna pray through that real quick because we've come into God's house to praise this morning, amen? All right, Father God, we love you. And Holy Spirit, we invite you into this room. And Jesus, I pray that you would awaken our souls, Jesus. Awaken our hearts. God, get us giddy for you in Jesus' name. Lord, we give you all of the praise, all of the honor, and all of the glory here this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on.
thank you for your provision. We thank you that when we put your kingdom first, that you provide everything that we need. And God, we just want to lay down those burdens to you this morning. You're more than enough. <laughs> you are inexhaustible, God. You are unstoppable. You have everything that we need, Jesus.
Worship Church, let's pray together. God, we love you, and we have seen your goodness. We've seen your mercy. We've seen your presence already here in this room, and we're so grateful because you come through for us every time you show up and you rescue us and you deliver us and you heal us and you strengthen us and, and you pour out the resources we need, things like hope and joy and peace and strength. And God, we are so grateful for you and we love you so much. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, church family, if you're here in person, turn and greet one another. We're so excited that you're here. If you're watching us online, we're also super pumped that you're with us this morning. If you would, somewhere in the chat, right where you're watching from, if you're on vacation, tell us what you're up to. We're just glad that you're tuning in and having that opportunity to learn more about the Lord. Well, if you are a guest or a visitor here at Fellowship Church, we're very excited that you're here. If you would, take out your cell phone and text the number 94000 and then text the word fellowship. And that'll put you in touch with one of our pastors, lead you through a series of prompts to just kind of get any questions you might have answered about our church. Or if you're in person and you watch it, you can stop by the information counter and let them know you're a guest and they'll do the same thing but in person. They'll also hook you up with a gift card to go to the church bookstore and pick out a specialty coffee drink for you and everyone in your visiting party, but we're just glad that you're here. If you've been wondering, I want to grow in my faith, but I'm not sure how. We have a spot just to get that question answered for every person in this room. The East End has a pergola that's called Next Steps. And the idea is no matter where you are in your faith, you can stop by that, have an individual conversation, tell the person your story, and they kind of are like the guru. They know everything about all our classes and small groups and serving opportunities, and they'll listen to your story, and they'll help you figure out what is your next step in growth. They'll kind of coach you through that and then give you the info and let you make your choices. But we would love to take anyone on to their next step if you're ready for that East End Pergola after the service. Well, um, the Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18, it says, Remember the Lord your God. He's the one who gives you the power and success to produce wealth in order to fulfill his covenant. So sometimes we look at our life and we go, man, this paycheck, this is me. I worked hard, my blood, sweat, and tears. And yes, that's true. But the Bible says in Deuteronomy 8 that it's God who gives us the power and the success when it comes to building wealth in our life. And that's why he says, hey, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to provide to you and through you. And when we partner with God in our finances, we're saying, okay, I acknowledge, Lord, you're the source. You're the reason that I have the, the common sense or the work ethic, the business insight that I need to be able to do this job well. So let's pray together. God, we love you and we acknowledge that you are the source. And we ask that as we give in this morning's offering, that you would bless us and protect us financially, that you would oversee these resources as they come in. And Lord, that you would bless the giver as each person puts something in today that, that they are acknowledging you as the source and the, the one who has provided them with that money in the first place. God, that you would heap blessings, financial blessings. Let their stuff last longer instead of breaking down. God, I pray that they would just be blessed in their commission sales, blessed to find the cheapest gas in town. Whatever it's going to take, God, to just stretch that dollar and just bring uh, resources into these families' lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And if you didn't catch it, by the way, the way we do our giving is online. Um, you can use all the directions on those side screens if you need a prompt on how to get signed up to do any of that. Well, there's a ton of cool stuff happening around the church this summer. Let's take this video and see what's up. Parents Super Kids Conference is coming up. This event is on July 22nd, 23rd, and 24th. It's a Friday, Saturday, and a Sunday. And this is for any of your students that are going into second grade through going into sixth grade. And of course, we have a ton of fun at this event. We're gonna take them to get air. We're gonna do kind of all kinds of activities here at the church, like carnival games, bump and jumps, all kinds of cool stuff. But we're also gonna teach them so many truths about who Jesus is. This year, we're focusing on healing her we're talking about prayer and of course a ton of teachings on worship and it's going to be so incredible so please sign your students up if money is an issue uh, we have scholarships available you can go to the information counter for more on those but the cost is $75 and that'll pay for everything that your student needs for that weekend spots are filling up quickly and we'd love to see your student there 
On the Church Center app, you each have created your own profiles for you and your kids. And a lot of those pictures are pretty outdated, especially when it comes to your kids. So if you wouldn't mind taking a second to update those profile pictures on there, that helps us with so many things over in the youth department and it would be greatly appreciated. It's super easy to do and should only take you a few seconds and it helps us out so much. Thank you. It's the summertime and we have so many great groups and activities happening all summer long. If you're interested in joining an activity group, you can go to the Church Center app. Under groups, under activities, you'll see everything that we have going on. We have mountain bike groups, we have a basketball group, we have book clubs, we have all kinds of really great stuff that you can get involved in. It's a great opportunity to meet people and to just have a ton of fun with like-minded people that love Jesus as much as you. So please, if you're interested, go to the Church Center app, get signed up for a group. As always, if you want to stay up to date on all of the events happening at the church, you can go to our website and click the events tab at the top and that'll give you everything that you need to know. We hope that you enjoy today's service. It's going to be a ton of fun. Check out this choir special. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He battle you're in a fight but sometimes you're going to fight with family members that's just the way it is sometimes you're going to fight with co-workers because you're with them a lot don't agree but you might even fight with your close friends but the one you're going to fight with the most is you and that battle is going to take place right here now, I don't know that because I've read your mind. I know that because I've read God's Word. When I was 17 years of age, I started studying the Bible as a Bible student. And since I'm older than Google, I didn't have serious help at all. I had a wall full of books, a half a wall full of cassette tapes by different teachers and pastors that I loved and that I respected. And I would pour into them to be able to understand and learn God's Word. 
And like many young Bible students, I began by trying to figure out the books of the Bible so I didn't look so ridiculous fumbling through my Bible trying to find a passage when I spoke. So I would memorize the books of the Bible. I wanted to know who wrote them, when they were written, who they were written to, what were the main themes of each book of the Bible, the Old Testament and the New Testament. I wanted to put them in chronological order because they're not in chronological order in the Bible that you and I carry. So I wanted to understand all that. I studied genealogy. I wanted to know, and not a lot of it, but I wanted to know uh, the people between uh, Adam and Noah, Noah and Abraham, Abraham and David, David and Jesus. And then on into the New Testament, I wanted to study the life of Christ, the first four books, and then the acts or the actions of the apostles who were filled with the Holy Spirit. The letters the Apostle Paul wrote to individuals, and then the letters the Apostle Paul wrote to churches, and then finally the book of prophecy, the book of Revelation. And in learning all these things, um, I found out that to know when the Amalekites attacked the Israelites in 586 B.C., the first nation to ever attack God's people, knowing that didn't help me be a better husband. Knowing that when Noah had three kids didn't, didn't help me deal with my coworkers. Knowing that Mary had a cousin by the name of Elizabeth who gave birth to John the baptizer, the forerunner of Jesus Christ, that was good information. But that information isn't necessarily going to help a young family dealing with rising or raising uh, gas prices that cut into their grocery budget. So because I had a deep desire to go deeper in God's Word, if that's what you want to call it, I also had a very strong passion and desire to want to help people. And those kind of knowledge and that kind of knowledge of God's Word might have allowed me to win a, a game of Bible trivia over at somebody's house or maybe frame a piece of paper and stick it on the wall, but it wasn't going to help me in the practical issues of life. And so one day I went back to what a seventh grade Bible teacher told me. His name was Mr. Edwards in a Christian school that I was going to. He was a pastor who had heart conditions, so he, he retired into teaching these kids in the Christian school. And one day Mr. Edwards came in and he took a piece of chalk and he wrote on a chalkboard the word Bible in an acrostic form. And then beside each letter he wrote these letters. Basic instructions before leaving earth. And I remember that, and I remember the second letter and the second word, instructions. And I thought, that's what this is. It's not just so that we might know the history of God and his people. It's not just that we might understand some of the cool things that happened and what God used to do. This was an instruction book. This book could help us with our marriage, could help us build a business. This book could help us in forgiveness issues and dealing with the difficulty things that have been done to us in the past. That this was an instruction book for life. And although the Bible teaches us we should know and understand all these kind of things that are taught in the Bible, one of these days we're going to get to heaven, and this is what I realized. When I walk into heaven, I'm going to know fully the Word of God. I'm going to understand it completely. And if those of you that have never cracked open your Bible and never put in any study or any hard work to understand it, you're going to know the very same things I know the second we enter into heaven. We'll have full and complete knowledge of the Word of God. So... My passion and my desire was to go deeper in God's Word, but now, not just so that I might win a Bible trivia game, so that I might be able to win in life and be able to instruct and help other people in life. So my teaching and my wanting to go deeper was about going deeper in my relationship with God, but then a passion to be able to explain and help other people when it comes to the life that we have to live and are going to live until we get to this place called heaven, practical Bible teaching and understanding for everyday living. Now, it's also a side note and very necessary for all of us to understand that it's never about the man or the woman that might be teaching or communicating God's Word. It really doesn't matter. The truth of the matter is whether it, whoever's talking head it is, whether you like them or not, if God is going to deliver his word through them, it's something that he wants you to receive. In the Old Testament, God used a donkey on one occasion to speak his message that was very important for that person to hear in order for their life to be saved. 
So God can speak through any talking head. It doesn't matter who your favorite is, who you like their personality, you like their gender. It doesn't make any difference. If God's word is being spoken through them, it's always something good. It's always something that can be helpful. And this is my prayer, that you'll hear me today, that you'll know that what I'm about to say is something that's been prayed for and something that I believe God truly, without question, wants you to hear. So this is what I want you to hear. This is what I want you to receive. Now listen, if you think your life is yours and has nothing to do with how God wants you to live, if your attitude has been, it's my life and I will live it any way I would like to live it, my question is, how has that been working for you? And then also, I can tell you exactly why it hasn't been working and it never will. And here's why. If you live your life your way without this instruction book, you are losing the battle that is going on in your head. I can help you with that. Let me pray. Father God, we love you so very much and thank you for loving us. Thank you for wor your word being so true. Thank you for loving us and giving us this instruction book. You created us. We acknowledge that you know how we should live. You set up a perfect way for us to live where we could, we could just have this wonderful, joy-filled, calm, peaceful life that's victorious, a home in heaven after it's all over. And Father, a lot of Christians are missing out on that joy, that happiness, simply because they're doing it your way, their way and not following your instructions. So, Father, softly, I pray that I'd, I'd be able to deliver this today, that it would be received in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I'm going to take you to this passage of Scripture, Old Testament, Numbers chapter 14. This is the Lord, Moses talking to the Lord. He already did. The Lord was mad at the ch his children. They had already disobeyed him. And Moses prays and says, please forgive them, Lord, the way they're acting. Just let it, you know, just let it go. And this is what the Lord says to Moses. Then the Lord said, I will pardon them as you have requested. But as surely as I live and as surely as the earth is filled with the Lord's glory, not one of these people will ever enter into the land, the promised land. They've already moved out of Egypt gone, and they're in the wilderness. They have all seen my glorious presence and the miraculous signs that I performed, both in Egypt and in this wilderness. But again and again, they've tested me and they refused to listen to my voice. Not history lessons, but instruction. They'll never see the land that I swore to give their ancestors. None of those who have treated me with contempt will ever see it. Now, why is that so important? Because the word contempt is this. And listen, it is a feeling that a person or a thing is beneath consideration, or that person or that thing is totally worthless. But my servant, Caleb, has a different attitude than the others have. He has remained loyal to me. Now, look at this. He, what there's, he's saying about Caleb is Caleb didn't go along with the crowd, didn't go along with the culture. He was different from everybody else. He wasn't following the flow. And the Bible says that he didn't say he remained sinless. God didn't say he remained perfect. God simply said he remained loyal. So I will bring him into the land that I explored. His descendants will possess their full share of the land. Take a look at the side screen to get started. How far you go and how much you grow is not just determined by what you believe about God. It is equally impacted by what you believe about yourself. Proverbs puts it this way, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. The Bible did not say, as God thinks in his heart, so will your life be. The Bible says, as you think in your heart. We know what God thinks about us, that you're loved, you're forgiven, you can do all things through Christ. But if you don't think that about yourself, then you're not going anywhere. If you don't line up your thinking when it comes to what God says about you, instead you line up your thinking with what you think you think about you, which it isn't you at all. It's the enemy speaking against your mind. It's the enemy putting these thoughts into your mind. If you don't do this, then all, this war is going to go back and forth, and the one who wins that thought is how your life's going to be set. This suggests that we are going to behave or live in a way consistent with the way we see ourselves, not necessarily the way that God sees us. So at times there's going to be inconsistency between how God thinks and how we think about ourselves. And listen, whoever wins that battle, whoever wins that argument, sets the course of your life. 
You should have received a text message yesterday that reads this. Your advancement in life is determined by who is going to win the argument in your head. The Bible tells us that mental arguments, look at this, are expressions of spiritual warfare. Therefore, you cannot be a child of God without being an object of an attack by the enemy. And one of the ways that he attacks God's children is by placing what the Bible calls in the New Testament vain imaginations in your head. And those vain imaginations are there to create arguments. These arguments, and how does he do that? These arguments go against trying to cause you to think uh, less of yourself than what God thinks about you. So these arguments from the devil, the devil puts these thoughts in your mind. You can't do it. You can't be that. Not now, not after the mistakes you've made. You can't be forgiven from. You can't recover from. These things are all arguments that the devil sets against what God has already said about you. And the one weapon that God gives us are these words, and it's a wonderful weapon we got to use from time to time, and that are these words, the devil's a liar. And not only is he a liar, because you've already heard that, it also says he's the father of lies. Okay, I get that now. Whoa, whoa, I'm not done yet. The Bible also says the truth cannot be found in him. So in other words, the devil, if he wanted to tell the truth, he couldn't. Here's the weapon. Every time the enemy comes against your mind, telling you something that is not true, you're stuck in that season. You'll never be happy. You want to get married? You're 50. You're never going to get married. You're not even going to go on a date. Lie. You're never going to get healed from that lie. My marriage is never going to get better. I want to stay in this stuck marriage, miserable for the rest of my life. Lie. Every time the enemy comes against you that is opposite of what God's saying, the way that you battle that is by going exactly the opposite of it. I'm 50. I've never had a date. I'm probably never going to be happy. The, the truth is God will make your dreams come true in any age of your life. All you have to do is put your faith and trust in him. He'll bring the person around you. All you got is wake up to it and take the blinders off and you'll see it. But you cannot believe the lie that's been spoken in your head that you're never going to get out of this season. There is a battle that goes on in your head, and it is a battle that is raging by the enemy, not by God. And you say, well, why is the enemy messing with me? Why does the attack seem so strong? Why are these things of anxiety and fear and what I see in the news and all these things, why are they just controlling my life and making me sad and making me miserable? And here's why. The reason why the enemy has picked up his attack on you is because the enemy has more faith in you than you do. Child of God, your faith has at least got to catch up with the enemy's faith in you. And you say, well, pastor, something's got to happen because I feel like I've been in a wilderness. And I feel like I've been in that wilderness for too long. I've been stuck in that same season for so long. I'm ready to get out. I've been in a wilderness for years. Okay, good. Good. Because once you've been there long enough, and maybe you have learned what God wants you to learn, now you are ready to move forward because the wilderness is not a negative place. The wilderness is a necessary place. It is a place that all of us kind of have to go in and out of to be able to say to the things that we had in our past life, our unsaved life, you're not going with me. I took you, uh, men that work in a man's camp at, a, at an oil field for too long. After about six months of that, am I telling the truth? After about six months of that, you got to learn how to be a husband again because those guys aren't necessarily Christian. They're not necessarily, what are you doing? I'm saying you went into a wilderness, you come back. Now you got to fix things. Why? Because you've got to get some of that negative stuff out of you that's not going to go with you into the next season. You say, do you got scripture on that? You know I do. Let's jump back to chapter 13. Now Moses is talking uh, to the Lord, and the Lord is talking to them. This is before they get into the wilderness. He's talking about how they're going to go and the direction they're going to go before they get to a place where they're complaining. Exodus 13, when Pharaoh finally let the people go, God did not lead them along the main road that runs through Philistine territory, even though that was a shortcut to the promised land. God said, if my people are faced with a battle, they might change their mind and return to Egypt. They're not ready. They're not ready for this battle, even though they think they are. They're not ready for this place of blessing, even though they think they are. They'll mess it up if they get it too soon. I got to slow them down. So God led them in a roundabout. 
Roundabouts are in the Bible. <laughs> God led them through a roundabout way through the wilderness toward the Red Sea. Thus the Israelites left Egypt like an army ready for battle. Now they weren't, but that's how they left. The wilderness wasn't a negative experience. The wilderness was a necessary experience. Watch, it only becomes a negative experience when you stay there too long. There's nothing wrong with this roundabout out here. You need the roundabout. The roundabout is necessary. It becomes negative if you don't take the exit. If you get on this roundabout and you stay on that roundabout, everybody behind you is thinking, take the exit. But you're a free will agent. You can stay on that roundabout all day. Just circle it. Just circle it. Just circle it. And we're saying, take the exit. When you go through periods of time in your life where things are stuck, where it's wilderness, where it's dry, things don't feel good, this isn't where you're supposed to be. No, it's not. The wilderness was never the place God's children were supposed to end up. God delivered them to something better. The wilderness was, this deception, deception is this, the wilderness was a better season than where they came from, but it still wasn't the place. Watch. The wilderness was just a path to the place. Don't stop on the path. Don't put a lawn chair out on the path. The path is meant to what? Keep going. But the enemy gets into your mind and says, it's the best you're ever going to have, better than what you had. But it's still not the where God wants you to be. It's a path. It is not the place. So this wilderness experience can be a positive thing for us, but it's only positive if you finally catch the exit and keep going. You see, we have a God of exits. There's a book in the Old Testament called the book of Exodus. It is all about God exiting his children out of difficult times, that he rescues, he performs miracles of an exit. I'm stuck here, Lord. No, you're not. Here you go. This, this, this marriage is miserable. Okay, it don't have to be. All, yeah, I can fix it. There's your exit to that miserable relationship. We can fix it right here. Take the exit. Well, if this is all you do, though, then all of a sudden you mix the exit. The reason why the wilderness is necessary for those of us that may be in those seasons or in and out of those seasons is because God wants to purge us from things that he will not allow us to take to the next level of his blessings. Purging means an abrupt uh, taking away from. And one of the things that he abruptly removes from our life in these wilderness experiences are issues. And all God's children have issues. All of us come from backgrounds or families where we didn't see a woman being treated right by an uncle. We didn't see our dad treating our wife right. We didn't see our grandpa talking to grandma the way that he should have. And listen, God's saying, okay, listen, here's how it's going to work. You and your wife aren't getting along. I'm not going to answer your prayers. So whether you break the catch-22 or not over the fact, listen, you don't even have to be wrong. Just say you're sorry anyway if you want me to answer your prayer. That's what he said. So now he says, if you want your prayers answered, you don't treat each other poorly, and then I'll answer your prayers. So what he's saying is, you can't take that generational curse to where I want you to go. That baggage isn't going to fit on the plane on the trip that I want to take you on. So you're going to have to remove some issues. Now, how do I know that Egypt or the children of God still had some issues from Egypt? They were out of Egypt, but Egypt wasn't out of them. How do you know? Well, they built a golden calf. Remember it? Moses went up on Mount Sinai to get the Ten Commandments. When he came back, they had a built a golden calf out of frustration and started worshiping this golden calf after everything God had done for them. You remember that? And God's saying, you're not going to take what you've constructed, constructed what you counted on, or what you're leaning on into the next level. You're only going to the next level, and this is what you got to learn, by trusting, looking to, listening to, and obeying my instructions. So you can stay stuck there with the issues of your past, or you can leave the golden calf and come with me, right? So what was he doing? He was saying, I'm going to have to remove, purge different issues you have. We all have issues. We all grow up, grew up in some kind of dysfunction in our family. We all were exposed to a culture or other people or friendship or somebody we allowed to influence our thinking before we ever got to this place in our life. We had to do away with all of that. That leads me to the second thing. Not only did he want to purge, he want to purge issues, but also he, in those wilderness experiences, and here's one, and people don't like this, he'll purge individuals. This is what I'm trying to tell you. Not everybody is going to where God is taking you. I need to say that again. 
not everyone in your life right now is going to the place where God is taking you. And sometimes the removal of those relationships are so abrupt, they can confuse you. What's happening to this relationship? What's happening? Where'd those people go? Can I answer it for you? God likes you. And God knew that they weren't good for you. God knew that they were holding you back and that they would never go forward with you. They would try to keep you from going forward. So God takes them out. Now, the interesting thing about this incredible man by the name of Moses, he was wise in a lot of area, but he failed in the area of letting God remove individuals from his life. There was a time where these individuals were rebelling against God, and, and Moses and God was saying, they're not going forward, and Moses prayed for them. And God was ready to remove them completely, and Moses prayed them back in. Listen, God's going to remove some people from your life, and hear me, you do, dear child of God, have the power to be able to bring them back. Moses did it, and you think, well, that was so spiritual of him. It wasn't spiritual. It was codependent. Moses needed them to need him. That's what that was about. And so here he is pulling these people back in his life, and the Lord's like, I'm trying. You see, what the problem Moses had was he didn't see them do something that was bad enough to be removed from their life because he didn't know something about them that God knew. And what God was trying to do was be proactive. And to move those people out of God's out of Moses' life before Moses heard what they were going to say about him behind their back, before Moses felt the, the betrayal, before, before Moses was walking around with a knife that was sticking out of his back. God was trying to spare him from all of that before they did something that would damage Moses' destiny too, and it did. Because he pulled people back in his life that he wanted to stay, that God wanted out, the Bible says that he got so frustrated and so annoyed by those people that when God told him to speak to the rock, he hit the rock. And then God said, see, they made you mad enough and annoyed you enough and made you miserable enough. Now you're missing out and going into the promised land. And if you would have just gone without them, then you would, have, you would be there. There are going to be times when God pulls individuals out of your life and you're not going to understand it and it's going to feel painful. And a matter of fact, it's even going to feel like you did something wrong when the truth of the matter is they were about to. And God's merciful that way. He, he knows they can't go with you. So the wilderness experience is to remove some people out of your life. So you got issues, you got individuals. Here's the last one, attitude. God's going to change some attitude. You complain too much. And I'm not going to let you take that mouth into the future. So there's going to be a time where you're going to have to stop complaining or you're not going. Oh, okay. You need to learn this is the time you learn to worship me, whether you see something to worship me for or not. Because even when you think I'm not doing something, I'm doing something. So you're not going forward with a complaining spirit. You're not going forward with a bad attitude. Issues, individuals, and attitude. Now you're ready. Issues, individuals, and attitude. Now you're ready. Issues, individuals, and attitude. Now you're ready. Israel could not get out of their head. They go through all these wonderful miracles on a personal level. They experience God's provisions personally. They experience his protection personally. They personally witness his power, but they couldn't get out of their head. And they thought this, we're too small to keep going. We're too small to keep going. Look at this. They weren't losing to the giants out there. They were losing to the grasshoppers right here. Look at the side screen. The battle you're fighting is not with the giants out there. The battle you're fighting is with the grasshoppers in here. He wanted his children to look to him. The I am of the relationship. The I am everything that you need. I am provision. I am help. I am strength, I am peace, I am calmness in your mind. I am what takes anxiety away from you. I am the comforter, I'm the giver of gifts, the Holy Spirit. He wants God's people's attitude to change, to the complaining to stop, and the attitude of I'm too little to completely be washed out of your life. They wanted big when little still had them. 
Would you stand with me, please? If you look back over your life, I think many of you are at a point, if you just think about it, where doubt is illogical. The preponderance of evidence would tell you, based on your history, doubt doesn't make sense. Why is that still there? You have personally experienced his protection, his provision. He's removed many of you from miserable situations and he's brought joy and happiness back into your life. You're sleeping peacefully into a house right now that one time you worried about whether you would have it or not. He's kept you alive. He's kept you going. He kept your kids alive, kept them going, brought them through terrible stuff, and here they stand. Preponderance of the things that you've experienced only makes doubt illogical. I found out something about me many, many years ago, and I told the Lord I'd never do it again. I was praying too little. I'd pray a prayer and it wouldn't get answered. I'd ask God that it wouldn't get answered. I'd ask him, big, you Lord, give us a new worship center. <laughs> Here it is. Lord, do this and do that. Boom. Then I'd pray some little thing for me and Anna. And nothing. I'm like, Father, really, come on. We need this. I like this. Come on, can we do this? And nothing. I, I, get, I get help. I call Anna, right? Well, Father, if you're not going to listen to me, maybe you'll listen to her. She, I know you love her. And we pray together. Nothing. And then finally, it dawned on me, I'm praying too little. I'm praying too little. Some of you asking for rent. Lord, give me rent. I need rent. God, help me with rent. I don't know how I'm on pay for gas. I need rent. How about, Lord, give me a position in that company that quadruples my pay. Give me favor with the boss and give me favor with the owners and I might run something that I might be able to bring home six figures to take care of my family. The money would never be an issue to cause me to walk around my house at night worried about whether or not I'm going to be able to be on the street or not. Father, you own everything and you are a big God and I'm tired, tired of thinking little and this little grasshopper thinking in my mind is no longer going to be there. I'm going to think what you want me to think and I can do all things through you and whatever's keeping the, the blessings away from me, take them out and bring them in, in Jesus' name. And you know what? That particular issue that I felt like we were praying too little for, I quadrupled it, and it came immediately. And I've never prayed little again, never. When I pray for you, I never pray little. Never pray little. Some of you just wish somebody would take you to coffee. I'm asking God to give you a Tim Tebow who's wealthy. That's what I'm praying for. I didn't want a cup of coffee at Starbucks. Well, how about dinner at the winery and not having to pay half? How about that? You know I'm messing around, but you, you get the point, right? Some of you have been in the roundabout too long, and you've got that roundabout driving down. I got it down, Lord. I know how to handle this roundabout. Just hang on to that wheel. Just, you know, you know I feel safe here. Everybody out there has got to yield to me. Nobody can come in here while I'm in here. Yeah. Wow. Well. I was like, hit an exit. Hit it. It's straight. It's paved. It'll be fine. Take it. I've never met a child of God of any age that didn't say the enemy still fights against my mind. Still makes me wonder, man, am I going to be able to provide for my family? Will this job play out? Will I get to keep it? Will the company stay open? All those things, all those things. Women, as I get older, will he stay faithful to me? As my body changes, maybe I'm not in the greatest mood. Will he still hold my hand and love me? All those things are lies coming against you. Your self-confidence is going to get hit the most. The enemy says you're not enough. God says you're more than enough. <laughs> Here, here's the trick. The enemy comes to you and says, try it. Do this. Everybody's doing it. You'll love it. It's fun. You do it. The second you do it, why did you do that? You're never going to make anything now. You're never going to be happy now. You blew it. Life's over. And then finally from a pit, you look up to God and go, did you see what the enemy just did to me? And God's like, 
yeah, I saw it. You know, that's what he does. Ask me to forgive you and we'll get going again. And the enemy's saying, you're never going to be forgiven. Nobody ever really forgives you. And God's saying, just ask me to forgive you. We're fine. And we'll get going again. Who's going to win that? Who's going to win? I can't win that for you. Will you? Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, I ask you, Father God, in the name of Jesus right now, to deliver us from little. Deliver us from little. Deliver us from complaining. Deliver us from anything that's causing us to stay on that roundabout. And I pray in Jesus' name for deliverance. And I pray in Jesus' name the people in this room would hit that exit and stop wasting time on the roundabout. Amen. Love you guys. Have a wonderful day. Thanks for listening to this week's message at Fellowship Church. If you've not made Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior, I want to give you the opportunity to do that right now. The Bible says in the book of Romans, if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And you can do that right now. I just want to encourage you to pray this prayer with me. Dear Jesus, I'm a sinner and I need forgiveness. Please forgive me of my sins. I believe that you are Lord, that you died on the cross for my sins and that you rose again. And God, I thank you for that. And I ask you now to be my savior, to guide my life and to give me a home forever in heaven. And God, I ask you this in your precious son, Jesus' name. If you just prayed this prayer for the first time, we would love to celebrate with you. Please text the word heaven to 94,000 to get in contact with our staff where we can answer any questions that you might have. And also, if you're in need of prayer, we'd love to support you. You can submit your prayer requests by texting prayer support to 94,000. Our prayer team will receive your request and immediately start covering you. If this was your first time experiencing Fellowship Church, or if you want to learn more about one of our many ministries here, text the word fellowship to 94,000 to connect with our staff today. And as always, we are still just a phone call away. You can contact us at 970-245-PRAY with any questions. And thanks again. We hope to see you next week in person or online.